Sparta, Athens, Corinth, Thebes. These are just a few of the more than 100 city-states that emerged all around Greece 400 years after the disappearance of the Mycenaean civilization. Before the advent of democracy in Greece, many of these city-states were led by a single ruler called a tyrant in ancient Greek. Around 540 BC, a tyrant named Polycrates came to rule over the island city-state of Samos in the eastern Aegean Sea. He was quite a player on the international scene. He made uh, tactical alliances, not just with the Persians, but also, for example, with the Egyptians. He was an ambitious figure. Polycrates saw that the path to power for an island like Samos lay through the sea. He built a fleet of 100 triremes, terrorizing neighboring city-states and taxing ships that passed through the surrounding waters. Under Polycrates, uh, Samos, his home island, became the dominant sea power, and that was the basis of his wealth and power. With his newly found riches, Polycrates built up defensive walls around his capital city and set about to solve a problem that plagued many cities in the arid Mediterranean climate, drinking water. Samos was a very, very important and powerful city. They were needing a lot of water, and they were short of water. There was a plentiful spring available, but it was separated from the city by the 900-foot-high Mount Castro. Somehow, Polycrates and his engineers had to figure out how to connect the city and the spring. Running an aqueduct around the mountain was not an option. You could construct a water supply system around the mountain, but the first thing a besieging enemy would do to cut off that water line and uh, there you are with your wonderful uh, fortification, with your wonderful new walls, and you're drying out. The solution required thinking outside the box. Polycrates turned to an engineer named Eupolinos. Eupolinos came up with a solution that literally meant moving a mountain, a tunnel running straight through Mount Castro. It would be a huge project and a lengthy one. The time needed for such tunneling should be enormous. Therefore, the decision was taken to drive tunnels from both sides. This is a mathematical and a technical problem. Like the engineers of the modern-day channel under the English Channel, Eupolinos dug tunnels from each side of the mountain until they met in the middle. To succeed, Eupolinos would have to be sure that each tunnel started at the same vertical height on opposite sides of the mountain. The tunnels also had to match up on a horizontal plane, otherwise they would pass each other like ships in the night. Without sophisticated surveying equipment, it was a remarkable challenge for an engineer to take on. One theory involves a short walk around a large mountain. By forging a path from the spring to the city in short perpendicular lines, Eupolinos could measure each small length in order to calculate two sides of a right triangle. With two known sides of the triangle, the hypotenuse became the path of the tunnel through the mountain. What made this prodigious feat of engineering even more amazing is that it involved not one tunnel, but two. The main tunnel was dug at a height and length of about six feet by six feet, but was only used as a workspace to dig a second tunnel, adjacent and below the main one. That would serve as the actual aqueduct. While the work tunnel was dug on a straight plane, the aqueduct tunnel was dug along the side and below. This second tunnel needed to be angled on a slight gradient to allow the water to flow gently downward toward the city. It was a matter of life and death in the dark and dangerous bowels of the mountain. Once they were in the mountains, the difficulties must have been paramount because rock may be moving in unpredictable ways. Water may all of a sudden splash up and cause havoc. This was uh, probably a constant danger. Apart from that, it was dark and needed to be illuminated, and you needed to constantly know where you are in order to keep your line straight. After slight adjustments, the two crews met in the middle almost exactly where Eupolinos had originally determined. 
The floors of each tunnel connected with only 24 inches difference between them, a discrepancy of less than one-eighth of a percent of the tunnel's 3,500-foot length. This stunning engineering achievement may have been the shining moment of Polycrates' reign, but his political fortunes would not prove so bright. The Persian governor on the coast of uh, Asia Minor decided that that degree of autonomy that Polycrates enjoyed was unsuitable to the development of Persian power, and he was arrested um, and uh, brutally tortured and crucified. Polycrates was just one tyrant among many who ruled the city-states of ancient Greece between 800 BC and 500 BC. The rule of the few over the many was the only form of government humans had ever known, but that was about to change. The city-state of Athens was going to change the course of world history. The visionary leader who would make it happen was named Pericles. His legacy would be an everlasting monument on the Athenian Acropolis that rose above the clouds. An amazing piece of precision engineering called the Parthenon. The word encyclopedia comes from two Greek words meaning a circle of learning. In 480 BC, when Themistocles defeated the Persians at the Battle of Salamis, he saved not only Athens, but also its young democracy, which had been born about 25 years earlier. For Athens, the age of the single ruler was over. Athens was rich in military might, treasure, technology, and ideas. She was poised for her golden age, and one man would take her there. His name was Paris.